Welcome and thank you for attending this program brought to you by the Goffstown Public Library, Books at Public Library, Manchester City Library, and the Nesmith Library. Um, just so you're aware, all participants are automatically muted and we ask that you keep yourself on mute and your camera turned off throughout the presentation. If you have questions, please send them through the chat feature and select everyone when sending messages. This session is being recorded for those who could not make it tonight. And we have a couple of upcoming programs. The Manchester City Library is holding a talk and book signing with local author Ken Sheldon for his new book, Deep Water, both in person and on Zoom. That is on September 6th. And October 18th, Manchester is holding a talk with Brandon Gauther called War is a Stern Teacher, Understanding the Russian Invasion of Ukraine. And on October 25th, Hooksit will also be hosting Ken Sheldon in person. Tonight's presenters are Colleen Stewart, the Communications Coordinator for the New Hampshire Food Alliance, and Josh Marshall, Director and uh, Director of Agriculture Development for the New Hampshire Department of Agriculture, Markets, and Food. All right, so with that, I will turn it over to you guys. All right, thank you, Tess. Um, so good to be here with all of you uh, talking about local food, which I'll speak for Josh is our favorite thing. <laughs> um, I'm going to share a little presentation with you all um, just to kind of give everybody a visual to follow along with. So bear with me while I get all that going. Um, make sure I share my sound too, because I'm going to share a video as well. Okay, here we go. Okay, eating local in New Hampshire. So um, kind of the whole focus of this, this kind of talk and presentation and discussion is kind of how to get started eating locally and making an impact with, with the way uh, you make food choices. Um, so as Tess pointed out, this is my, uh, myself, I'm from the New Hampshire Food Alliance, um, which is part of the Sustainability Institute at UNH. Um, and I will let Josh introduce himself in a little bit. But the New Hampshire Food Alliance is a statewide network um, that coordinates many things, but one of which is New Hampshire Eats Local Month. Um, we are housed at the University of New Hampshire at the Sustainability Institute. And our goal is to kind of engage people, businesses, organizations um, who are dedicated to building a growing and growing, a thriving, fair and sustainable local food system here in New Hampshire. So we do a various amount of meetings and, and organizations and presentations like this, educational presentations um, to kind of move that, that um, goal forward. And we do a lot of our work through these six focus areas. Um, you can see all of them there. I don't have to, I don't want to read them all for you because they're long, but um, the main one we'll be kind of thinking about tonight is this growing the movement of local eaters. It's, it's engaging everyone in um, eating locally and, you know, in whatever way that means, whether it's growing your own food or going hunting and fishing or going to your farmer's market, the whole spectrum of what it means to eat locally here in the state. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to focus in on tonight. And I will let Josh introduce himself and the Department of Ag. Yeah, thanks, Colleen. Uh, so um, I'm Josh Marshall, the Director of Agricultural Development uh, for the Department of Agriculture. And um, just a, a caveat, I'm very new. I just started uh, in July, um, <clears throat> so bear with me. But the New Hampshire Department of Agriculture, um, you know, our, our mission is to support and promote agriculture and serve consumers and business for the benefit of public health, uh, environment, and the economy. So while the name is Department of Agriculture, uh, we don't just serve farmers. You know, the farmers and consumers support each other. Uh, agriculture provides a public benefit beyond the obvious of a healthy food supply. There's uh, cultural benefits, environmental benefits, and economic and tourism benefits as well. So um, our, our charge is, is to make sure that um, the farmers and consumers are both benefited by, by what we do. And um, Colleen, if you want to advance the slide, I'll talk a little bit about um, the different divisions. Oops. Um, so there's six divisions within the department, and each of them have a different focus. So agricultural development, um, 
you know, our focus is sort of statistics and information about um, New Hampshire agriculture, uh, assisting in, in marketing and promotion of those products. And, uh, and we also manage the New Hampshire building at the Big E in Springfield, uh, West Springfield, Massachusetts, which is coming up in September. Animal industry, uh, they're responsible for the keeping, uh, for keeping domestic animals and poultry populations safe uh, through monitoring, testing, licensing, vaccination, that sort of thing. Pesticide control ensures safe and proper use of chemicals um, on the farm, and uh, they support integrated pest management um, integration onto farms, which is you know, to reduce the amount of um, inputs and uh, to do things as safely as possible. Uh, plant industry, inspection of commercially grown nursery and green stock, uh, greenhouse stock, monitoring for invasive species of plants and pests, some that you might be familiar with, uh, spotted lanternfly, there's a big push to be monitoring for those, um, and there's a lot of uh, invasive plants that, um, that, are, that are hard to deal with, um, so they're, they're really key on that. Regulatory services assures compliance with all the laws and rules. They do organic um, inspections and certifications for farms in New Hampshire and, and a number of other uh, inspections uh, for maple producers, things like that. And then weights and measures, they regulate commodities sold by weight uh, or measure in state commerce. And it's not just the farm scales, uh, it's grocery store scales, it's your um, gas pumps, it's, it's all sorts of things. So there's a lot of things that uh, the Department of Agriculture reaches out to that you might not think um, from just the name. Um, but the next slide, this is actually interesting. This was uh, something that I put together at my previous job with the New Hampshire Farm Bureau Federation, um, which is really, it's really kind of cool that it, it lined up with, with you folks in Hillsborough County for the most part. Uh, this is a spotlight of three different farms in Hillsborough County, uh, Brookdale Fruit Farm, Connolly Brothers Dairy Farm, and Trombley Gardens in Milford. Um, to show a little bit about how they connect to the community, the different things that they're doing on their farms, and uh, and how you can participate in um, you know their products. So, uh, if you want to let that roll, we can. Yes, I'm going to stop sharing. I had it preloaded, so I'm hoping it goes well. <laughs> um, one second, and um, Josh is going to be humble, but Josh was the mastermind behind this beautiful, beautiful video we're about to watch. So um, kudos to Josh on his beautiful work. Okay. Share the sound. Here we go. And if at any point you can't hear or see, um, please let me know. Hi, I'm Chris Connolly from Connolly Brothers Dairy Farm in Temple, New Hampshire. Here at Connolly Brothers Dairy Farm, we're a highly diversified small family farm. Our main business is that we milk cows, but we have many other aspects that keep us busy throughout the year. We have, besides the traditional dairy farm, we have recently gotten into the direct sales. Um, we have a farm store, which we started around the year 2000. Um, and just recently this year, we've added on and built a whole new facility for our retail store. So we can really push that on its own and it also give us more end in the production room um, for making the ice cream, which has really been booming in the past probably 10 years. We do about 52, 54 flavors throughout the whole season. Uh, so some of them are just seasonal flavors, some of them we just do on and off um, that may not be big sellers uh, this year, but next year they're going to be huge. All of our ingredients, we try to get as much local as possible. Um, we use our own maple syrup for all our maple product ice cream, uh, our maple walnut, maple cream, and our sweet piggy. 
been doing maple syrup since the 70s, but it wasn't anything, you know, we only tapped like half our trees up back. So we maybe did 300 taps, you know, and it was just more of a fun thing and we'd sell a little bit here. Now it has that, the tourist component, you know, and marketing component for the, the bigger operation. So those different businesses, some of them take place year round, others are seasonal, and they each have a, an important part in the business um, that helps, helps with cash flow at different times of the year. Now that we sell direct to the consumer, we get to talk to the consumer. Um, they come and visit us in the barn. We explain what we're doing. It's neat to see the families come up, you know, and they think this is the coolest thing. And, or it makes it, you know, the, the pride that we have, it, it really, it just makes us feel better. It makes us feel more responsible for what we're doing. Uh, hello, welcome. I'm Sean Trombley from Trombley Gardens here in Milford. Uh, we're at Sunny Prairie Farm, which is a very, defer very diverse New England farm. We have a retail farm stand. We retail a lot of our own produce, our own meat. We raise 130 head of beef cattle. Uh, usually raise about 30 hogs a year. It's about 150 acres total of land here at the farm, of which we have 15 acres of mixed vegetables, 10 acres of sweet corn, and the balance is in cow corn and hay for hay production that we retail as well. So being such a diverse farm, we don't really have an off season. I mean, I guess dairy farmers don't either, but um, springtime starts, February in the greenhouses, getting ready for bedding plant production. Um, then we roll into, I mean, we have the beef cattle here on the farm, which don't require a whole lot of care other than other than feeding and cleaning. We move into bedding crops, uh, planting, planting crops in the field in the spring, corn, early greenhouses. Uh, greenhouse, we do have a couple of greenhouses for, for early season cropping. Planting all of our early vegetables and sweet corn early to try to get maximize the early sales. And right into hay production in the summertime. The ice cream walk-up windows, we started scooping ice cream in the spring of 2020, just before the pandemic, and it, uh, it actually was huge. It has been busier this year, and as our name gets out there that we're doing ice cream, um, it is homemade ice cream. It's made by a friend of mine down in Dunstable, Mass. This year, we started an addition on the farm stand, and we are hoping to bring ice cream making in-house. So we've only been in our new farm stand for a year and a half. We've already got a 10 by 50 addition on the back. So. Um, we're trying to do more, trying to offer more, just trying to make it a destination farm. All right, hi folks, I'm Trevor Hardy from Brookdale Fruit Farm here in Hollis, New Hampshire. I'm the seventh generation of the Hardy and Whittemore families that are here operating uh, Brookdale Fruit Farm. So our farm here in Hollis, uh, we're primarily focused on fruits and vegetables. Long before my time, we had uh, animals and a dairy operation, but uh, now we're primarily focusing on fruits and vegetables with hundreds of acres of apples and sweet corn and vegetable production, as well as peaches and other specialty fruits. Uh, so right now we grow over 40 different varieties of apples. There's roughly around 260 acres of apples within production. Uh, there's also, also several acres of peaches, plums, and um, sweet cherries uh, that we have in production as well for tree fruit. So Brookdale's made up of four different divisions. Uh, we have wholesale, retail, pick your own, which we have on its own, and uh, the farm supplies. As far as grown farm goods, wholesale's our largest market followed by our retail and then our pick your own. Um, we are known for being the largest diversified wholesale farm in New England and we service over 38 different grocery stores and over 200 different farms and farm stands throughout the region.
Uh, our farm is a member as well as many other farms in the Jamaican H-2A program as members of the New England Apple Council uh, who help offer as our agent to fill out all the paperwork and get our labor force here for us. Uh, and I've been with them in another organization that they work under, the U.S. Apple Organization. I've been to D.C. Uh, many times actually they're lobbying and talking about the issues we have with our migratory labor force and why they're so important to us in order to get this work done and harvest all our crop. Uh, we also have a farm supplies division which I operate and manage uh, which is the largest in the northeast region selling growing supplies and consumable goods to all the other farms throughout uh, the northeast. So Hillsborough County within the state has the largest direct-to-consumer sales within the state of New Hampshire. That's over, uh, from the last farm statistics, it was over $9 million annually within Hillsborough County. So one of those advantages is that's the top 40 to 50 counties within the country and the largest within the New England region as direct marketed goods to consumers. So that's where Hillsborough County has a unique perspective of agriculture, not only in the state of New Hampshire, but in the whole entire Northeast region. We do have a close-knit community here. We still have a handful of dairy farms in the county, um, some beef farms, we have an elk farm, uh, some goat farm, a goat dairy, um, several fruit and vegetables, apple orchards. Um, so we do have a really good community of farmers here that do help each other out when where others are in a bind. Well, I think Hillsborough County is a, in New Hampshire anyways is a unique county in that we're the most populated county um, in the state. But we have very rural areas in the county and we have you know very urban areas in the county, at least for New Hampshire considered urban. Um, and we happen to be right on the edge, so we're, you know, only 20 miles from Nashua and Manchester, both. We're 60 miles from Boston, 20 miles from Fitchburg, you know, but people come out here on a day trip thinking they're in the North Woods, you know, and, and so that is kind of a neat, neat thing with the county is that there's both extremes in the same area, you know. And when people are looking for, the experience, that's a great way to put it. When we run our, our U-Pick here, it's been over generations we hear from folks during apple harvest that, uh, oh, I've been coming here since I was you know, eight years old and they're now in their late 20s with children and we wanted to bring our next generation of our family here and it, it's valuing that, that family and that personal experience with connecting those folks with our farm and uh, with what we have to offer here in Hillsborough County. And it's not just apples and vegetables, it, it happens all year long. Uh, our other neighbors in the, in the maple industry within the county, uh, they see people that go there all the time. The spring and summer annual and flower sales and that type of stuff and berry sales that happen in the summer. Uh, it's the same kind of thing. People want to have a positive experience, connect with the farmers and the growers within the region and uh, be able to relate that uh, uh, to the rest of the family. Right. So that was a wonderful video from Josh. Josh, do you want to say anything more about the, the video to folks or? Yeah, yeah, I could say a few words. It's funny. I haven't watched it in a while. It's uh, I've spent so many hours looking at that footage. It was nice to take a break and, and see it again with sort of a fresh perspective. But I think some of the um, important things to take away from it is uh you know, what the farmers do to try to make the experience enjoyable for consumers. And it's, it's not, like I said, it's not just about the food, although that's obviously the most important part, but um, they want consumers to connect with them. They want them to see how they produce their food and have that connection and, um, and be able to spend some time too. It's, it's a, um, it's, it's a tourist, tourist uh, driver as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to kind of take a lot of what we just saw really on the ground things that are happening in your communities um, where you all live and um, kind of connect it to these larger ideas about eating local, and what that impact is and kind of how you can really do it in all the different ways um, and opportunities there are in New Hampshire to do that. So we're going to move on here.
Yeah. So, so building off that video, you know, th those are just three examples of uh, outstanding farms that you can actually go and visit and get some local food. But, you know, one of the questions we get is how do you find it? You know, folks aren't aware of where the farms are or how to find them. And um, we have within the department of agriculture, we have uh, a number of, uh, you know, I think eight or 10 different directories that we compile each year um, for CSAs, which is consumer uh, supported agriculture, um, farm stand, farmers markets, wholesale, pick your own, livestock, uh, and a number of other directories. So you, if you visit the um, Department of Agriculture website, which is agriculture.nh.gov, you can find uh, you know, pretty much anything you're looking for in any of the areas that you're at, whether it's Hillsborough County or anywhere else in the state. And then there's a number of other organizations that also have their own listings. There's the New Hampshire Farm Bureau that promotes their members, NOFA NH, um, which is the Northeast Organic Farmers Association. They have promotions of their members and UNH Extension has a um, statewide map, which is sort of interactive. You can um, you can type in, you're looking for apples and um, it's connected to GPS. So it'll show you the little dots on the map of, of where those are. Um, so there, there's always a way to find it. And that's that's what I think is key is, is getting the information out there to folks to, for how to find it. And um, you know, I'll go over what 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 a CSA is. Sort of, it, it's it's kind of like folks at the beginning of the year will pay a subscription almost um, to, to a farm and what they call a share. And uh, throughout the growing season, you get a share based on your uh, contribution uh, each each week or each uh, every other week, whatever it is. And um, I have some friends in Ringe that are always posting on social media what they get in their their basket. It's it's whatever's whatever's um, in season and whatever the farmer has. And so it's kind of like a, a mystery box each, each week of, of what we're gonna get. And, um, and people take a lot of pride in figuring out what to make out of what they get in their box. Um, and one of the newer, newer things, actually, Colleen and I were both at um, Sweet Beet Market yesterday in Bradford, New Hampshire. Um, they're a great, uh, representation of what a food hub is. And there's a lot of really small farms. Um, when I when I talked earlier about how we look at the statistics of, of agriculture in New Hampshire, there's about 4,200 farms that report to USDA uh, that they're in their farming. And more than half of them operate under 100 acres. And if you look at dive down deeper into those statistics, the majority of those are you know under 25 acres. So you've got a lot of small farms that are operating on an acre, five acres, highly diversified. And when you can combine 10 or 15 farms in an area uh, to one local shop, you have more that you can provide to the consumers. There's more of a one-stop shop. Um, you know, I've I've heard in the past, folks. You know, you don't want to go somewhere just for a cucumber. You want to go and be able to get a lot of your shopping done. And, and so food hubs is a new thing that's coming on. Uh, Three Rivers Farmers Alliance down in um, the southern part of the state is another example of that. That's uh, several different farms that work together to uh, offer a wide variety of things. Um, Trevor mentioned in his in his portion of the video that they sell to supermarkets. It's actually, you would be surprised, but uh, if you shop at Shaw's or uh, Hannaford's, um, you, you're, you're probably buying local sweet corn um, when it's in season. And Hannaford's does a really good job of promoting that. They'll have displays that tell you exactly which farm that you're buying from. Um, I go to the Hannaford's in Concord just to get some stuff from Brookdale um, and other local farms, um, Shaw's. I'm not sure if they advertise it as much, but I know several farmers in the region that sell sweet corn and, uh, you know, winter squash and things like that uh, to them. So you actually can get your local food from the grocery store as well. But the more of that dollar goes to the farmer if you actually visit uh, a farm stand or a farmer's market, of which there's probably 50, I think, uh, in the state. Um, so there's there is really opportunity for everyone to participate in these um, if you know where to find them. And so, you know, go to our website, call us up, talk to Colleen and the folks at the Food Alliance, and we'll make sure you find uh, where to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, at the end, I have a huge slide of all these different links that are just going to make your eyes cross. But um, it's a lot of great information that we'll share with um, the folks at the library to get 
get out to you and all the kind of things that Josh just referenced, um, we'll have a link to. So that will be good to have. Um, all right. So um, make sure I'm on the right thing. There we go. So we kind of just talked about where you can find local food, um, all the different places. And you kind of see that listed here again. But I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, accessing that local food. I think um, there's a lot of conversation around um, cost and pricing and, you know, everyone's obviously out here trying to stretch a dollar. We all know that. Um, and the perception often is that food or local food could be more expensive or is out of reach for, for a lot of folks who are trying to be mindful of their budget. And um, I think beyond the just the understanding that a couple, the couple extra dollars that you might pay for a cucumber or tomato is is going directly back into the, the pockets of your neighbors and your farmers and your community. So just knowing that impact um, is kind of something that we talk about a lot when we're, we're talking about making choices between local and um, kind of food from far away. <laughs> but other, these opportunities here that are on the screen are great things to take advantage of. Um, programs and things that are run by the state, things that are run by charitable organizations in New Hampshire that provide the opportunity for folks to get um, not only sign up for, for benefits to, to get local food and to get food um, into their households, but also to get double, which is like the best. <laughs> you can get double the amount of fresh fruits and vegetables um, with for folks who participate in the SNAP, EBT, and WIC programs. Um, they can use the Granite State Market Match and the Double Up Food Bucks program to get double the amount of fresh fruits and vegetables. So just free money um, to buy all that great local food. Um, another great opportunity too, and Josh talked about um, the CSA model, the Community Supported Agriculture model, um, organizations like NOFA New Hampshire, the Northeast Organic Farming Association of New Hampshire, and um, Cheshire County Conservation District and a few other organizations across the state do um, do these kind of fundraising opportunities where they raise money within their organization to offset the cost of a share for folks um, who are at a limited income capacity. So all of these kind of different kinds of programs are out here to make it more accessible for everyone um, from little kids to um, our, our older generation folks who get access to local foods um, and, and kind of make it a, a more even playing field for everybody. So again, I'll be sharing some of those links as well if folks are interested in taking advantage of stuff like that. Our next thing, it kind of, you can see a theme in my slides. I'm liking these like lines and connections. <laughs> um, okay, so we talked about finding local food where we kind of figure out where, where we can go and um, who we can talk to, to to find out where I can, you know, get local food. We talked about kind of access to local food and making that kind of a, an equitable thing for everyone. Um, and now we're going to kind of talk about what, you know, when you choose local, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean for the various, um, these various ideas and things that, you know, we might hear about or think about when, when we're buying local food or thinking about choosing local food, but um, kind of really playing, teasing out um, what it means and like how you can make an impact. Um, so the biggest thing when you choose to eat local is eating local and eating seasonally. And I think that is a huge, um, it's a huge kind of learning curve. I, you know, we all kind of had this learning curve of growing up and being like, we can have strawberries all year round. Why not? They're at the grocery store. But when you really realize it, especially living in the Northeast, you know, strawberries are in June. That's just how it's got to go, <laughs> you know? So um, being mindful of that, and it gives you the opportunity to try so many different fruits and vegetables that you may not have had the opportunity to, or even thought about trying because, you know, you're so used to having the same things available all year round at the grocery store, um, you know, thinking about seasonal food. And then um, my next favorite thing, canning and freezing um, this in-season fruit, these in-season fruits and vegetables is a great way to like extend that season. Um, there's, I hear it all the time and I'm sure Josh is going to shake his head. There's nothing better than pulling out a bag of blueberries or peaches that you froze and just enjoying that in January and knowing that 
you know, they didn't get trucked from California or wherever, nothing against California, but it's nice to know that um, they're, you know, they're nice and local. They were, you know, you preserve that freshness right when they came off, off the vine or off the tree. Um, and that's a really great way to, again, like extend that season and, um, you know, eat seasonally, eat locally. Um, another thing, and I think this kind of plays into what Josh was saying as well, about um, local food at the grocery store, there's a lot of opportunity to eat locally and regionally, which is um, another thing that we like to think about here in New Hampshire and, and New England is we have a, a, a plethora of amazing farms, not only in our state, but in our region in Maine and Vermont and Massachusetts and um, all of that regionality together um, is pretty delicious. And a lot of it can be found at your grocery store. So um, flip those things over, you know, flip over your butter, flip over your, you know, your milk or, um, check out the signs at the grocery store. Cause a lot of times you won't even realize that there are pretty local things just right there at, on the shelves in Hannaford's or Shaw's or wherever you do your shopping. Um, then we have, uh, reducing and reusing food waste. So that's another kind of benefit of eat, eating locally as well. Um, and it kind of connects to that you know, being mindful of when things are in season, canning and freezing, um, but also kind of thinking about things that you may normally throw away that would be amazing in, in different types of dishes or kind of reusing them um, in ways that you wouldn't imagine. Um, pesto is, I think, a great example of that. I think I've made a pesto with about every single green thing that I can find and you know enough cheese and enough uh, nuts that go in there and it's just it's it tastes good just throw it on some pasta but you know just kind of trying to to waste less and and use parts of the fruits and vegetables that um, maybe are not traditionally used is a great way to you know reduce your food waste um, and then you know obviously we're using things great a uh, great way to eat locally and get a more uh, bang for your buck. You you know you buy those beets. You want to use those beet tops. It's it's kind of a a two in one um, a two in one vegetable. Um, some of the other things too are kind of meal planning and shopping, like making a shopping list, planning out your meals, like being thoughtful about you know how much food you might need for the week, so things don't get stuck in the back of the fridge. We we all know that sad spinach in the back of the fridge. It happens all the time. <laughs> it's okay. No one's no judgment and we all do it, but, um, the meal planning and the, sh and, you know, creating a list before you go to the farmer's market or before you go to the farm stand really will help with that kind of intentionality. And again, save you that money. You don't want to just throw things away and, um, not, not, ex you know, use what, uh, what you paid for. Um, and some of that, that meal planning and that shopping and this kind of cooking, making pestos, I know those are skills that sometimes aren't always in practice for us. And, you know, when we have five minutes to get dinner on the table, it's not our number one thought, but, um, you know, building some, some home cooking skills, we have a great amount of programs in, in the state, um, cooking matters and, uh, you know, various cooking classes that are really fun, especially for kiddos. Um, I know kids love, love getting involved in the kitchen. So, um, those are a great opportunity to kind of sharpen those skills. Um, the last thing we kind of want to talk about is a little bit different from that, these two other things. Those are kind of very, you know, eater focused, um, you know, benefits of eating locally, but um, kind of to the point of, of Trevor and Josh's video and what Josh kind of followed up with is like knowing your farmer, knowing who, who produced your food and um, not only knowing them as a person, but just knowing like what kind of practices they use um, and, you know, being being mindful and having agency in that um in that choice is is a really good thing and it contributes to um what makes our local food system resilient um we can we kind of have this organic versus conventional versus industrial kind of complex and um i think i've i've had folks ask me and i'm sure josh has too and I, i'll let definitely let him speak to it a little bit but um, you know, what's better or what's worse and, and what these things are, but, and we'll talk about it in a little bit when we get to our climate uh, friendly eating, but, you know, New Hampshire, as Josh said, has small farms and most small farms are not these, you know, big, scary farms that we see on TV or that are portrayed in the media. Um, a lot of them are extremely responsible and thoughtful about how they produce their food. 
organic versus conventional has some very unique and um, very unique and very um, complex, I would say, but not complex to um, not too complex to understand, but just like these nuanced differences um, that all, although are um, can be a little bit maybe not for not for everyone to think about all the time, but they it's good to know the difference. And um, some of the organic practices, um, you know, lean a little bit better in terms of climate and environmentally friendly, but your conventional farmer is by no means out here to destroy the earth. Um, there is a there is a significant difference between our conventional farmers in New Hampshire and the industrial ag industry. So we'll get a little bit more into that in a little bit. But so Josh, anything you want to add to the the ramblings I just put on? There? Well, no, that, I think you I think you did you did great. I, I would just yeah I would just add that you know I get asked all the time um, from friends who who don't have an ag connection you know should they eat organic or conventional and and I say both. Um, I, I say shop local. Uh, it when you get out to visit a farmer um, who's who's growing conventionally, what you what you realize is that it's it they're they're not doing anything that they wouldn't feed their own families with. And if, whether it's livestock or fruits and veggies, um, it doesn't benefit any farmer to do things that uh, hurt the environment or hurt their animals because they either won't produce or they won't have a good product. Um, so I, I really um, would challenge folks to get out there and just meet their farmers, regardless of their um, practice and, um, and would reiterate just sort of that point of, in New Hampshire, we don't have any mega mega farms that are you know two hundred thousand acres growing the same thing. It's just not. It just doesn't exist here. So um, some of those fears that you you may see from the media, um, just realize that you can go and visit a farm in New Hampshire and, and learn for yourself and see firsthand uh, what folks are doing to produce the food that you eat and the food that they eat. Mm. Yes, I think that's a great point. Um they they are feeding their families and that's you know why why would they want to feed their families something that um would hurt them so that's a a good kind of a good way to to decipher it all right on to the next oh this is a great one josh you take oh, it away yeah yeah so <laughs> i i learned actually i learned about this a couple of years ago the new hampshire farm bureau young farmers do a uh, they picked up what's called the 10 gallon challenge and it's a social media um, challenge where there was a, a news broadcaster in uh, Ohio, I believe, who started it and he went and bought 10 gallons of milk and donated it to his local food pantry and went online and said, you know, who's next and did a hashtag 10 gallon challenge and um, they caught wind of it and decided to do it in each county of New Hampshire. And I was deciding I was going to take part and take up the challenge. And when I did, I was looking at this bottle of hood milk and I saw that code you know underneath the date and I was wondering what that was so I looked it up and when you're buying milk um oh I'm sorry my dog wants to play um when you're buying milk from um you know that's from from hood or or from another local producer if you see that code 33 that means that it was uh it was made in Concord and uh and it's it's New Hampshire milk you know all the uh New Hampshire dairy farmers that are part of the co-ops that um you know, sell bulk milk, it goes to be uh, processed there and bottled there. So again, it's another example of when you're at the grocery store, you you can actually get stuff that was made in your backyard. So be conscious of what you're doing when you're shopping, take a look at that milk jug. And if you see code 33, you know that that was, uh, the, that milk was produced in New Hampshire. Yeah. Just uh, I would also add uh, really quick, um, butter, butter too. Um, Cabot butter, I, I, I believe it's Cabot. I hope um, that's um, that's New England regional. Um, it's it's New Hampshire, Vermont, um, and Massachusetts. So when you're buying butter, you know instead of maybe buying that one from Minnesota, um, you know look for Cabot, and you're supporting your local farmers that way too. Mm -hmm. Yes, Cabot's a, a great kind of they make so many great products, and you kind of can feel good about about that. Not that this is the cabbage show, but <laughs> <laughs> I like cheese. I like yogurt. Um, but yeah, the, the milk thing is great. And it's just, again, pay attention to those labels, flip, flip that, 
flip over those those products and just check out where where things are made you'll be really surprised honestly um all right next thing so this is this is kind of related to that flip over the label thing and just thinking about where our food comes from um and kind of what is its journey to get here um and this is a great kind of visual example of that um this is a great little diagram that actually it's a from a farmer's market in New Jersey I had connected with and I was like this is so awesome thank you for making this because it so clearly lays out um this difference between you know you have your garden at the top and the the transport from your garden to your home there's you know not, there's just footsteps you know so and then you get all the way down to something like a meal delivery service where it starts at a farm um, it's transported, it's packed and distributed, it's in it's in its packaging, it's now getting delivered to your home, and then it's on your plate. And so that journey and all of the, the different, you know, fuels and plastics and boxes and people and labor that takes to get something that could you could have gotten down the street from your house or, you know, from your farmer's market and and been on your plate in a matter of minutes um you know had this really long journey and um I am no nutritionist but I do know that as the longer something sits and you know it's longer tomato sits on a truck the less tasty it is and the nutrients you know they they're just not as vibrant and there's not as much of an opportunity for for us to absorb all the great things that are put into those those fruits and veggies so um when you're thinking about you know, where you want to get your food or, or um, you know, thinking about where things have come from and, and looking at labels, kind of remember this diagram and, and um, thinking about just the, the chain, the supply chain, never mind the fact that we saw during the pandemic, and I know, <laughs> I know I'm tired of talking about it, but it's very, very true that a lot of these things broke down. A lot of these transports that you see here you know, just, just cover those up because those, those got kind of broken down and whether it was from a labor standpoint or just plain old people couldn't be at work because of self health and safety issues. Um, you know, that's, that's a break in that system. That's why those, those shelves were empty is because those middle pieces were not there to, to get the food to your plate. So, yeah. Colleen, can I, can I make a, a comment on that? Sure. Um, it, there was hours of footage from each of those farmers uh, that didn't make the cut. But Sean Trombley at Trombley Gardens told a, a pretty uh, interesting story about what happened during the pandemic. Uh, his his farm stand has um, is really a, like a little grocery store. Um, they, they have a lot of things that uh, if they don't grow them themselves, they get from the Boston market. Um, they have some local uh, companies that make prepared meals, different things like that. And they have a bakery um, inside. And he said that when that happened, folks, um, the, the consumer sort of forced him to change his model. And he was doing um, deliver, uh, pick up off the, the porch stuff. And they were asking for more foods. And so now if you walk into his farm stand, you know, he's got limes and lemons and bananas and, and things that he, that, you know, so yes, they're not necessarily local, but you were, you were getting them from your local farmer and they became the place that people wanted to go rather than the grocery store. Um, so I think that there's, there's an opportunity. It's, it's sort of eating intentionally. You know, we all, we all have to eat, but if you put a little intention into the way you look at eating, um, you can, you can find those locally sourced, uh, options. Mm, absolutely. I love that. Eating intentionally is, it's pretty much the takeaway from this whole thing. Uh, yeah, that's a great local example of, of kind of shortening our food chain. Um, all right, we're going to move on to the next slide. So we've been a few places. We're finding local food. We're getting access. We are thinking about what that that impact is on and what those benefits are of eating local. Um, so let's think a little bit about that from a from a climate change and an environment perspective. Um, inherently, just as in as we just talked about eating locally is climate friendly it's plain and simply from the standpoint that food does not have to be traveled and transported on airplanes and trucks and all these things um to get to where we are and that for one is just a um climate friendly practice in and of itself but um there are many other things that we have already talked about that um are not only benefits to just eating locally but benefits 
to our climate and eating locally. Um, so it's, you know, if not local regional, it's that kind of keeping that food supply chain short, keeping it locally, keeping our dollars here um, with our neighbors and our, our communities. Um, again, eating seasonally, you know, if you want to, if you're eating strawberries in January, I'll use that example again, they're coming from California. And so it's that same kind of impact of travel and transport that is going to kind of impact that, that food choice. Um, reducing and reusing food waste, I think is not something that we all think about as, as home consumers and eaters. Um, but a lot of that food that, if it gets thrown away, it gets into a landfill and is, is creating, creating problems for our environment and just um, not, not being a beneficial opportunity to reduce our, our climate footprint. So thinking about trying to just reduce our waste altogether, um, but reusing it, as we talked about before, um, in just different ways in the kitchen, but also composting and um, doing that at home, which is a whole other thing that I'm not qualified to talk about, but we can we can put a bookmark in that for another day. But those are the things we kind of like to think about when we're reducing and reusing food waste. And kind of again, and we, you know, we don't have to go back here, but knowing your farmer's practices and knowing just knowing your farmer and knowing that um, the the local choices that you're making here in New Hampshire are for folks who are growing food the right way. Um, and, and being really thoughtful and mindful about how they, how their farming is affecting the environment. Um, Josh, do you want to talk about anything on here or do you feel good about that? No, I feel, I feel good about that. All right. We're moving right through. I want to get to some questions. So I think this next slide is a doozy. <laughs> and I um, didn't know if I wanted to get really into it. And I, Josh and I were talking about this earlier, but um there is as well a social justice component to eating locally, and it really hones in on this small farm versus industrial farm. And as Josh um, had pointed out, and we've talked about a little bit, um, there is no industrial farming in New Hampshire. It's just not a thing. So we are all very much, very well and good to be in that that left side of the screen under that that small farming um, column where all of these these kind of social justice ideas and understandings are a part of what our small farms do. They're economically democratic. They're transparent about their practices, both from a labor and from a from just a farming standpoint. Um, they, you know, as Trevor talked about in, in, in his interview, there's fair labor practices. He's, you know, down in DC lobbying for, for organizations that are, are treating folks fairly and giving people opportunities. Um, and there's, you know, regenerative farming practices and just being thoughtful again about what's going in the ground, what's going on the food, what's how animals are being treated. Um, and there's, you know, that industrial farming side is kind of that polar opposite, but that's a huge topic. And I think it's something that I hope if, if folks are interested, we could come back and talk a little bit more about and kind of get into the weeds with it, but that's kind of your social justice. One. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I would I would just add, you know, because this is that it is a, a huge, a huge topic and, it, and it's it, it's complex. And um, but, I, you know, I, I like to to talk about it. It's also an economic problem in terms of um, economies of scale and, you know, consolidation, wh whether it's farming or any other um, industry. You just when you when you get so much consolidation and um, production in one area, then it's harder to do some of those things on those those left hand columns and and we we need food you know we need to have um i thought i read somewhere that you know it's i i don't want to say the statistic because i'll mess it up but it's, it was you know talking about how much chicken we eat in the united states and and so yes we do need um, a lot of processing capacity. Um, but the more local meats and vegetables and fruits that you buy economically, that incentivizes more people to produce more of that. And um, your dollar is really, you know, how you how you can sway um, how that happens. And, and again, I would just reiterate, you know, when folks ask me about something they see on TV um, from a farm in a different part of the country that's on a whole different scale, I remind them that that doesn't exist here in New Hampshire. Our largest farms would be considered tiny um, compared to some other places. And that gives them the opportunity to be more, uh, I'll use it again, intentional uh, in the way that they do things. And, um, and just, again, go talk to your farmer. They would love to tell you about what they do. Um, 
and, and show you how they do it and why they use the things they do and, and, and how that works for them. Absolutely. All right. Okay, we're getting towards the end. This is um, New Hampshire Eats Local Month is August. Um, and this is kind of the prime time, I like to think, um, for local food in the state. And um, there's a lot of great things that are in season, tomatoes and corn and all the, some of the stuff we talked about. Um, and we at the Food Alliance, as well as the New Hampshire Department of Agriculture, Markets and Food, as well as uh, some other uh, organizations um, across the state that are more regional, Monadnock Food Co-op, Seco Seat Local, we all kind of come together to celebrate our local food during August through New Hampshire Eats Local Month, which is um, very simply just a, a month-long celebration of local food. Um, we at the Food Alliance and all of our partner organizations um, are posting on social media and we're we're sharing our, our different lists and our different um, you know uh, food guides and all these things, just all the resources and all of the the fun ways that folks get involved in in the local food system during the month. And it's really just kind of a way to showcase the amazing um, work of our farmers and the amazing work of our food producers in the state. Um, and it happens every year, happens every August. Um, this year, I know it's almost over, but there's still some time. We <laughs> did a Live Free and Eat Local Challenge. Um, the challenge was to eat at or from five or more farmer food businesses that are in New Hampshire. Um, so if you go to the Concord Farmer's Market on Saturday, you could probably knock out a whole challenge in one go because there's so <laughs> many wonderful vendors there that are all from New Hampshire and are, are showing their and uh, uh, selling their delicious local foods. Um, but easy, really easy to get involved. We got some history on the on the right side there um, with how the Eat Local Month got started, um, very much from New Hampshire Department of Agriculture, bringing it to a statewide thing and just kind of everybody had a had a helping hand in, in getting this kind of month-long marketing and promotional campaign um, together. But if, again, there's a, I'll have a slide with all the links and information, then you're more than welcome to check out the website and get involved in any way you can. Um, any thoughts on Eat Local Month, Josh? Uh, I just, I, I love it. I, I love it. I think it's awesome. And, and we, we always kind of say in the, the ag Provi service provider uh, world, you know, it's not just August, but we use August because there's so much food that's in season in New Hampshire during that month. You know, obviously we encourage everybody to eat local all year round and you can, um, but August is just such a great representation of the diversity of food products um, that New Hampshire provides. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's right. Eat. We eat local in August, but we also eat local all year round. All right. Um, so I know um, Brittany and Tess, they said that we're going to do some questions. I don't know. I can't see the chat, so <laughs> I don't know if there is any, um, but I, and I know we only have about five minutes, but that's our, our that's our show. <laughs> so I'd love to talk local food with everybody if, if there's anything anybody wants to ask. Thank you, Colleen and Josh. That was great. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, just going off the last thing that you said, Josh, and uh, Colleen, I think you said as well, you know, we can eat local all year round. So where and what can we eat local come, say, December, January, February? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll field that one. Um, so what, you know, there's, uh, there are a lot of products that store very well. Um, and you'll see, you know, a lot of sort of, uh, fruit and veggie farm stands will, will shut down, uh, after Thanksgiving, um, for the winter or orchards, that sort of thing. But there's also a lot of folks that have, uh, potatoes, squash, carrots, um, things like that, that, that are, they're still for sale, um, all winter long, um, meat, eggs, dairy, uh, and there are a number of winter farmers markets across the state um, that offer food, baked goods, um, things. You know, it's there's New Hampshire isn't thought of like this, but there are actually a number of farms that are starting to do revive uh, grains. 
Um, there's a farm. I mean, if you were standing in the, uh, the state house dome, you could look down on a field of wheat being grown in New Hampshire, and uh, they sell that product at the Concord Farmers Market. So, um, you know, you could take some of that and, and make some baked goods. Um, you know, yes, you're not going to find your blueberries or your strawberries, but with, uh, you know, if you're making a chicken soup, uh, in the middle of the winter, you can find all the ingredients you need um, from a, a winter farmer's market, uh, from all that stuff that's stored well, the local meat. Um, and then you could uh, finish it off with some uh, ice cream or some pudding um, that's made right here in New Hampshire. That's great. Thank you. Elizabeth has a couple of great questions. Has the spotted lanternfly been seen in New Hampshire and how are our farmers tackling it? So uh, I, I think that it's been luckily for us in New Hampshire, most of the time when it's been spotted, it's been during the inspection um, of when um, rootstock or trees come into New Hampshire. And that's part of what the Division of Plant Industry does is uh, they have inspectors that go out there and check on those things. And so they can quarantine those um, products before they get to the marketplace. I'm not aware of, um, you know, and, and um, Pierre Seigert is the um, director of that division. Um, she would have a much better answer. But from, from what I understand, we haven't seen too much of it. And, and really what it affects most is uh, grapes and hops. Um, it can affect some apples and things like that, but not as much. And, and so as New Hampshire increases, oh, that's another one you can get all year round, beer and wine. Um, those, you know, those, we have some breweries and some wineries that are growing grapes and growing hops here. And, uh, they use barley that's grown in New Hampshire at Henniker Brewing Company. Um, if you go there and you buy the beer Moral, um, that is got barley and, uh, wheat from that farm I was talking about in Concord. Um, so, you know, you got to look out for that. And as we increase increasingly have the ability to grow grapes and there's the demand for that, um, I think the spotted lantern fly will be a, a, a much bigger problem. But right now, luckily, um, we haven't seen it as too much of a problem. But if you see them, um, you can alert uh, us by going to the uh, www.nhbugs.org. You can send in a picture and, um, you know, the folks over at Plant Industry will identify what that is, whether it is a spotted lantern fly or not. Um, and I've seen some promotions uh, that, that say, if you see it, squash it. Uh, and so it's not, you know, it's not the most fun uh, tagline, but, you know, you really, they're, they're really a nuisance. And so if you do see something that you think is a spotted lantern fly, take a picture and then step on it. <laughs> Great, good advice. And is there a website where we can find the local codes for products like the 33 for milk that you mentioned? Yes, there is. And I'm sorry, I don't recall it. Um, it, it might be, that would be a good question for the Granite State Dairy Promotion um, folks. Uh, but that's how I, that is how I found it when I was doing um, the donations. And uh, it's just been so long ago that I, that I forget, but you could, you could type in the code or take a picture of the code that you have on your milk bottle. And then it would tell you uh, which plant that was, that was made from. Uh, it might even be a hood um, website or, or something like that. But I, I bet you, if you did a, a, enough Googling, you could find that out. And, um, that's something that we can, we can find out for you and try to try to get back to you. Great. And thank you, Colleen. I see you put the website in there so we can share that when we post this video. Yeah. Absolutely. Any questions? Right. This has been really great. Thank you so much, Josh and Colleen. I feel like I've learned a lot. I've learned some new things and feel inspired to visit some new farms around New Hampshire. That's awesome. Thank you for having us. And um, yeah. Yep. Thanks. Eat, eat, eat local. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank, thank you both.